up about daylight and looked out and not couldn't see anything, just dust. And explosions were going off all around us. We were in an artillery barrage. I guess maybe that was the first time I really prayed. Finally, a word got out. I said, boy, I said, this is a group that's going to make an invasion. And the next day, well, sure enough, Eisenhower came and he talked. He said, I uh, feel honored that you would pick uh, to make this invasion. And then people were, uh, they were volunteering more than any other race. There was no animosity toward the service, you know. They were really volunteering. And you grew up, you grew up fast in the service. I will tell you, oh, that, that, that military life, life is rough. In the 30s, I was going to school at Kellerville. And so we had, we had ball team, you know. And uh, then during the summer, we had an a independent team. So we played ball all the way around. Of course, when we had depression, uh, we weren't starving because we had everything we needed on the farm, with the exception money money we didn't have but growing everything that uh, we needed well we was well you know provided i took a uh, agriculture when i was up at Chilaco and uh, for about a year or two i was the president of the farmers uh, future farmers of america there at the Chilaco indian school and then then i played uh, i was in the band while I was there too, I learned to play the saxophone. Well, I was still in high school. Uh, I graduated in 41 from high school. And uh, we just were not aware of that. We were more interested in, in whether Preston was going to beat Schulter in a ball game. There was nothing else to really do in those days, except, oh, they had church meetings. Oh my God, they really did have church meetings. I mean, People really went to church. An Indian man that had little money and he'd have ball teams in the summer, you know. The, down to church, down to Big Sikta. And we'd go off, every week we'd go off somewhere and play these other churches, you know. And then Sunday morning, uh, people, they have cars. They just had, used to ride horses mostly. And you could hear people walking, coming down the road. They would be singing. And at the school, they would have a place there for them to have church. Then we had uh, our little old hometown. They had entertainments. And through the week, on every Saturday night, we, uh, we had what we called street dance. And that's where I learned how to dance, and I enjoyed it. I formed a little dance band while I was there too. I had one drummer and a, one a flute uh, guitar player. I had a guitar player and then a bass fiddle player and uh, myself. There were just five of us and uh, we'd just get together on the weekends or somewhere and we could get away from everybody where they wouldn't, we wouldn't bother anybody. It was, play it to our heart's content. We didn't use no music, we just played by ear. <laughs> At the age of about 14, 15, I learned to barber. So I started doing that. I charged student 10 cents a haircut. There's another Indian guy around here had money and he had a basketball team. And uh, we, we played basketball all winter. We had pretty good success too. We had good teams. Every church brought their own set of tents. And they could, they could cover this area here all over. Just nothing but tents to come into to the church convention. And association, those two were the biggest meetings. 
And they went for, I guess, a whole week. They'd come in first of the week and stayed clear through Sunday. And they really, well, same way the other way too, uh, storm dances, they had storm dances. Between the church and the stop, you didn't have too much to do. In those days, there wasn't no bus. Uh, on a rainy day, well, here, here the, come a kid down the road just a hauling, singing on, carrying on. And, and we'll be pouring out of raining, and oh, we go to the school, and, and uh, oh, we have muddy shoes, our clothes just be wet, we'd be sitting in a desk. I remember my mother was working, but uh, we didn't get to eat till about nine o'clock at night even. You know, bring home some bologna so we could eat, wake us up, eat, eat supper. A lot of us still burned uh, kerosene lamps. That was the only lighting we had. A lot of us still got our water from water wells. We didn't have running water. And uh, so, uh, you know, when, when you speak with Native Americans about pre-war, you're talking about people who still lived in, in rather primitive conditions. And so uh, a lot of the things that were happening in other parts of the world um, just made no impact because we didn't have the means to, to observe that. We didn't know too much about, I didn't anyway, about world events until Pearl Harbor happened, you know, and then that that woke everybody up, I guess. <laughs> I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. I'd heard about uh, the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, but I guess I didn't know too much about history. I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. I <laughs> never had heard of it. Fortunately, one of my roommates had a radio, and uh, so I was listening to, to the music and, and doing my setting, and then all of a sudden, this voice came in and said that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Well, I didn't have any idea where Pearl Harbor was, and I could not understand why it was so important that they break in on this musical program and give deliver this message. Well, like I said, we didn't have no kind of radio where we could hear what was going on. It was more or less neighbors discussing, telling, you know. I went to the show that afternoon, and when I and got back up to the campus. I don't know who the person was, but some student told me that they bombed Pearl Harbor. He said, Japanese has bombed Pearl Harbor. We had war with Japan. Now he says, speaking to us recruits that just joined the company, he said, no, you just, uh, just came in the company. This is where you show your stuff. You know, it's going to be real McCoy. And that's what I say. Oh man, just feel like just, just, just feel like if you had died, that whole warm feeling just goes over your whole body. You knew you was gonna be taken sometime or another. And when I got drafted, well, God, Lord, said, uh, uh, I don't know anything about fighting. Don't know anything about. The, uh, and uh, and uh, you see them tanks and everything, you know, and said, said and I tell you, it's going to be something I don't know nothing about. Maybe five of us in our community, you know, went. So the community always had services for their boys in service overseas. Well, my mother, she was hurt, but when I get about ready to go overseas, well, I told her I forget that I was here. Just worry about these other boys, because I know that I was I wasn't coming back. I told my mother I'm going, you know, and she just said, "Well, good luck, I guess, and hope you get make it all right, you know." Mother said, "Well, she said that uh, she had a boy already in there already. She said that that was enough worry by him being in there already." 
And now she said, I'm going to go, she said. And so she said, there. she just about got sick over it. By the time they, they just shake hands with you and just turn around. Just, they just couldn't take it. My aunt, too, when I was getting ready to go to town, you know, the Indian, they have ways. And she had a little buckskin bag made up. She had a string on it, and she said, here, I want you to wear this. She said, wear it all the time, she said, you'll never be, you'll never be thirsty. And she gave me that when I left. And I wore that thing every day, I think, till I got home. Oh, my uncle, when he was taking me to town, he said, he was talking Creek, went like this. He said, he said, when you, you're gonna become a soldier. He said, you're gonna have to carry a gun. He said, when you shoot, he said, every, you, I want you to shoot and make that first shot count. He said, if you miss, and whoever you're gonna be shooting at, he said, if, if he don't miss, he's gonna get you. But at that time, I believe it was John Davis who was, was chief at that time. And he gave a, a short farewell speech to the fellows, you know. And uh, he told us that uh, he would uh, keep us in prayer and told us that I'm sure that each, uh, each of you fellows, wherever, whatever church you come from or what denomination you belong to, I'm sure that they'd be praying for you. And that was a last word that, you know, we had heard from our chief. People held their emotions pretty good, both ways, the soldier or the service people and, and the mothers and fathers. Well, anyway, we got there where there's a sergeant, I guess, and he told us, line up. So we lined up. Oh, he marches. And marches, boy. Oh, he throwed his voice, you know, boy, you're really rough, you know, boy. Oh, I said, I don't know about this. <laughs> I don't care what kind of pretty hair you had. They'd cut that off for a second. I'd would put you down a door in a dog. Or, you know, your pride. And, Ego, whatever he had, oh, went down the drain. Of course, uh, when we first got there, we had shots, you know. Uh, I remember very vividly having uh, three shots at one time. Uh, the corpsmen stood on either side uh, of you, and, and uh, they just shot you, gave you your inoculations on either arm. And then, then we went to the dentist, and the dentist would uh, look at your teeth and then uh, if you had to have some teeth filled they'd fill them but they they wouldn't deaden your they wouldn't deaden your gums well boot camp to me I was a draftee and boot camp was kind of a joke we'd get out of everything we could I know uh, there was one or two suicide right in the back of my barracks where I was living due to the fact what uh, how true it was what they were writing to this kid or these two fellas I do not know but it was family back at home that they committed suicide they felt that I'll never be home to see my parents so I'll just do it over here Ich will heute wieder ein Prophet sein. Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die deutsche Regierung der Erde und damit das Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. Hitler spoke over that radio, and I don't know a word in German at that time, but the tone of voice that's coming from that voice is 
it's, it's strong, you know, the sound of it, it's so deep and just, you know, force behind it, the voice that bringing those words out. And I thought to myself, he don't sound like a happy man. For an uneducated man, he was smart. And he made a move at the right time. I don't know what I'd have done if I'd have made him. <laughs> but on the thing, he was causing all that problem. He was just like, well, that's right now, I can see he was just like a devil. During that time, uh, Worcester talked to my grandma about that, because she couldn't talk English. So we used to tell her about things, what's going on. And the Germans, and uh, this man, Hitler, she said, uh, she called him uh, Red Man, I mean Red, he's a devil. That's what she used to call him. So she gave him that name because he's a devil. He was the whitest of any white that could be. You know, and his troops were kind of like that. If you didn't have the same rank as they did, they didn't want to talk to you, or things like that. It, 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 there was no mercy. Oh man, I, I was told we admired Russia because they, they they fought a total war. I mean, that was total war. That was, even though they were white race. They still, oh, they, they, they dealt out misery to each other, Russia and Germans did. But like I say, he was, uh, he annihilated the Jews, and you know, they're white, and so he, I'd, I'd say he was, uh, they were trying to be the whitest of all the white, and something like that you, you, you never could stand for. <laughs> soldiers were the Japs. They wouldn't give up. Uh, a lot of times, they'd, uh, if they were surrounded or knew they couldn't get out, they'd commit suicide. A lot of them did that. And they felt it was an honor to die for the emperor. They were selling all the scrap on and stuff to the Japanese, and everybody had made a big joke out of it. Yeah, I said they're going to be turning around and throwing it back at us one of these days. I think everybody remembers that picture of that little baby that was sitting there in that bombed out area and just crying its little heart out. And I saw then that the Japanese just had no real compassion for, for other people. And, and some of our guys found that out for real. Uh, down the road. So, it, you, you know, <laughs> it seems terrible to say, but I, I hope they're still burning in you know where, because <laughs> uh, they, they, uh, they were responsible for a lot of good people being killed. Her grandma used to say, but here's one thing that these white people uh, they're going to get so smart that they're going to do away with themselves. They're going to make things that's going to blow themselves away. Even my parents did not understand English much. and Well, they didn't, period. But they've always had a feeling that uh, us being... Uh, uh, oh, getting into the Stuttke world, so to speak, that some of these days something like this would happen. You're going by stages. You've already seen this other stage. You're going from boy to manhood, and then you're going from there, and they, they get you down there. They, oh, that propaganda is, is really something. It, it, it'll even, they'll even take you out to the ships, and you, you will load... Uh, Rounds of ammunition, 155s and some other, any kind of ammunition. You start loading them on ships, and then they, you say, my God, there is a war going on. <laughs> so, well, I always figured, well, someone would make it. It may as well be me.
My grandma used to say, and then there's going to be a war. And I said, the, the Indians going to uh, be called to fight along with the white people. She said, there's going to be a lot of Indians going to lose their lives. Long time ago, when the Indians used to get into war with the soldiers way back there. But here now, said, uh, we come now, I said, when they have a war, well, we're going to be fighting right along with the soldiers. You receive a call to bring one of your squads over to another sector of the battle perimeter. You have a truck at your disposal and you load your men. You're going down this mountain road, you come around the curve and you see a little child sitting in the middle of the road. What do you do? Do you stop and pick that child up and set him on the side or, or do you just run over him and go on where you're supposed to go? And that's the decision you got to make. It's a moral judgment. Do you spare that child or do you spare the whole country? There was three of us up there on top of that hill laying down because we were under fire. That MP, he was kind of a young boy. I said, stay down now. He made a bad mistake by raising up too high because they got him right in the head and he never knew what hit him. We were 90 miles from London and you could see them bombing it every night. They just, just glistening and glowing in the dark. I mean, they were really pounding London. Well, just lost cause. Because we didn't, we didn't have anything, no artillery or anything other than World War I stuff. I didn't fear nothing, because I know that I was dead. And I, I didn't fear nothing. One of the Marines I went with, this friend of his had become so despairing that he just took his own gun and just blew his brains out. I know one particular guy, he wrote to his wife every night, never missed a night. But he used to tease him, George, why do that? So well, maybe somebody is dating my wife, but I'm gonna keep up this correspondence. Maybe when I get home, if I get home, I'll see him. That's why I'm doing this. And this old pilot won't know if we want to go riding with test flight. We flew with him, but he used to be uh, Hitler's uh, private pilot way back when the war first started. He said Hitler was a rug beater, he called him. He said he'd get mad, get down on the floor and beat on the rug and chew on it and scream and holler, and then he'd get up, and he said he was all right then. But he said he, he'd throw a tantrum and he'd just get out on the floor and beat on it and chew on the rug, and he called him a rug beater all the time. There wasn't nothing up there to keep the Japs from coming on. One pull at our nickel tail, they gave a water treatment, stuck a hose in his mouth and turned the water on, and held his nose and everything, and just forced water in and turned until they killed him. I directed the tank, tank dozer. The guy was falling, getting hit. You can tell you, jaw was getting by yourself. But there's another group headed in the back of you. Everybody's falling. We didn't, they barely made it. And I get hit uh, late that evening. I pray that uh, the Lord wouldn't let one of those hit my foxhole. And he didn't. And, but several other guys were killed that morning. Uh, were hit with the, the shrapnel or the shells. Hit one guy that looked like he, he maybe had uh, been real close to one of those shells because we found parts of his body scattered all over the area. An arm over here and a leg over there, and it was bad. The Air Force used to bomb about two weeks ahead of us. 
And when we get to these towns, the people, some of the people uh, was ordered to leave, but they, some of them didn't. And those that didn't, when these air force bombed, oh, I tell you, there are bodies, there is bodies, there's arms, there is legs, head, just here and there. And uh, then there's some of them, body was hanging on the side of the wall. Oh, it was awful. And that's what, you know, down you see a little children in there with it. Then, and then I thought, you know, that's, that really, that really got me right then. We could always tell when we were getting near a Japanese camp. Uh, they had a peculiar order about them, and they, you could smell them before you ever got to their camp. There was a barn sitting here to our left, and we'd already cleared out everything, and then we backed up, settled in for the night with the doughboy or anything. I guess the German patrol didn't know we was in there. We didn't know that we were, uh, the tanks and everything was already in there. And we let them get right in front of the tank, and I mean, we were all let in them. And we didn't see them, but they laid there and cried all night long, hollering for their mamas, I guess. You become scared before you get there. You're bound to get hit. They told us about that. There would be a bear if you come back. One night, we had to go out and meet another platoon, not a squad, not, maybe a jeep or something, meet us towards the end of the line. And then we come back, and what's going to go about 1 o'clock that night. And our post had reported some, they had some heavy equipment out that way. I don't know what's going to go. Uh, I guess them boys must have been shaking. I could feel that flow shaking. I didn't know what would have happened after the Japs come in there. They took us to an old Spanish prison, a Villavid prison. And then they sent me out to Nickel Field. Well, that Nickel Field, they were real bad. One fellow at our Nickel Field, they fastened him up, tied his hand behind his back, and fastened him up to uh, lay him in the tree there for two or three days till he passed out and died. We wouldn't get no food up there. That's the part that I, I showed it. I just, I don't know, I just want to save it. Your body can take so much and you want to do your job and you want to stay alive too and do what you can, but begin to work on you a little bit, your mind too, you know. You, you get tired, you can't think. You get kind of sleepy and groggy, you know. You, you don't have time to think. You do what you can do right then and that's it. Because you won't get another chance. If you can hide, hide. But keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing. What I was supposed to be doing, that's why I got hit. I laid there and hollered. And I was mostly in shock. The sergeant and I were standing on the, kind of on the brow of a little hill, looking over a kind of a valley. And uh, all of a sudden we heard a sniper down there. He's shooting at us. And he hits this boy standing right next to me. But yeah, I've often wondered why did he choose to hit him instead of me? I don't know. See, when I was over there, I never got to speak my uh, language. I guess I was over there maybe almost three years, and I never spoke a lick of my language. So when I got back, I had the hardest problem trying to speak to my people, dad and mom, and, and they didn't know how to speak English at all. Before the breakthrough, that was just before Christmas, uh, we stopped. Uh, it was uh, snowing 
Oh, we couldn't, nothing couldn't move. So we just dug in sit. We was on the outpost. Well, where this outpost, where we was at, you could see across the field, you could see those Germans walking around over there. So one, one evening, there's two Germans held a white flag. They would start walking across the field where we coming towards where we were at. And so we all got ready, you know, we didn't know what was going to take place. And they came all the way up there. One of them could talk uh, English, but he talked broken. And uh, so they came. First thing they asked was, they wanted a cigarette. So they sit down. So we sit down with them. And we talk. And what they told us, they said, uh, uh, they're just like us. Said, uh, we don't want to fight you. We don't want to hurt you all. They said, uh, and uh, we have a family. We don't want to leave our family. But he said, uh, Hitler done all of this, he said. So we don't obey. He said, we'll be killed. We were hauling gasoline and ammunition for George S. Patton. And we couldn't keep up with him. Some driver had missed a turn or something with his truck. And when I got up there, well, I got out. And about the same time I got there, well, old George S. Patton got there. He jumped out of his Jeep and went up there. I won't know what's going on. And the little driver told him, well, I'm Mr. Turner. So finally got him straightened out. And, and when he started to go, old Patton told him, when you get back to your unit, tell him I said not to ever send you out again. <laughs> Sergeant picked me out to help feed the prisoners. We drove in there where the prisoners was walking around and sitting there. So when we seen that, they seen us, well, they all started coming. They knew they was going to get something to eat. So I stood on the back end of that truck and I was handing them the bread to them. Well, they stopped. That MP blew the whistle and he, for that truck driver to stop. He and MP come up there. Oh, he sure did chewed me out, he said. He said, he said, I don't want you to wait on these people like they're civilized. He said, I want you to throw that bread out there. He said, oh, they were handing him the bread. They said, I don't want you to see, see you do that no more. I said, well, I said, I didn't think I, I, I want my food to be thrown at me out there. You know, so regardless where I was at. So he so, said, well, don't do it anymore. So, so I started throwing it out. And that really got me, you know, because uh, that just like feeding a stalk, you know, throwing hay out there, you know, for them. Well, that's what that reminded me of. This friend of mine from North Carolina, Turkey, Jacob Carnesville, he said, I want you to go back with me back of the ship. He really asked you, he says, we're going overseas. This may be the last time we get to see the skyline of the San Francisco Bay, town, the city, and all, all that pretty lights that we saw. And But the main attraction is the Golden Gate Bridge. He says, I want you to stand here with me. And he said, who knows? Says, this might be the last time we're going to get to look at it. And he said, if, if we come back, if we come back, he kept saying, if we come back, we both come back up front of the ship and just reverse it. And the ship will be coming back in. And first thing we'll see with the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and we know that we get close to home. He said, would you shake hand on that? I said, yeah, I'll do it for you, Jake. I shook hand with him. He didn't say anything, and I kind of looked up at him. Tears were just rolled down his cheek, you know. And, you know, I forgot all about that. Well, after the war, and you know, I was coming home. And on the ship, just about 30 minutes before we see this skyline of the, the Golden Gate Bridge, everybody was getting excited. Everybody was, was just talking. And they couldn't believe that we were coming in, you know, coming home. 
getting louder and louder, you know, and people talking, you know, just, just, you know, getting hepped up about you. So it hit me. I got to get to the front of the ship. Boy, I went up there wiggling through a bunch of them guys standing my way. I just wiggled through and kept going until I got up right to the front of that thing, almost the hull of that ship, you know. I stand there on the deck. Pretty soon, all of a sudden, that picture come. Golden Gate Bridge. There it come, like he said. It would come back. But this time, I was by myself. And I was the one who had them tears come down, down my cheek then. It seemed as though they took the flower of manhood and put them in these horrendous situations and then expected them to come out like they were when they went in. And there's just absolutely no way that could have happened. Just no way. <laughs>